Welcome everyone to Can We Digitize This? Should We? Navigating Ethics, Law, and Policy and Bringing Collections to Digital Life. I am Michael Lang, the Copyright and Information Policy Specialist at the UC Berkeley Library, and I'm joined today by my colleague Stacy Reardon, our Literatures and Digital Humanities Librarian. We are thrilled you can join us for an overview of the work the UC Berkeley Library has been doing to address critical issues guiding how and whether we can provide online access to our collections, particularly for special collections. The workflows we will be discussing today came out of the UC Berkeley Library's Digital Lifecycle Program, which we shorthand to DLP. This program was started in 2019 to help create the backbone of the library's new digitization program ahead of the launch of our new digital collection site. The overall goal of the DLP has been to create an adaptable framework for digitizing our collections at scale and making them publicly available online. Today, we will briefly touch on these workflows, paying special attention to the ethics and policy consideration. Links to all of the material that we discussed today will be on the last slide and in the transcript of the presentation. Stacy and I would like to start this presentation by acknowledging all of the many people who played a role in bringing to life what we're going to be discussing, even though they're not speaking today. This includes members of the library's various DLP working groups and Rachel Sandberg, UC Berkeley Scholarly Communications Officer for leading these groups. And as we will discuss more later, our workflows were built off the recommendations put forth by the Native American Collections and Archives, Libraries and Museums Working Group. And we are very grateful for their excellent work. I also would like to take a moment to recognize and respectfully acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo Ohlone. We'll start this journey with brief context for why we needed to address these issues and create policy for the library. Obviously, we want to encourage robust use of the research-rich collections we steward. One way that we facilitate access to and use of our special collections materials is through digitization. Implementing digitization services of any size or scope, however, requires cultural heritage institutions to confront four key law and policy issues, which we identified as copyright, contracts, privacy, and ethics and policy. Not only must all US institutions navigate these complex areas, but also they will need to make localized determinations about how to proceed when uncertainty arises. In the absence of a lot of public information on how to navigate these concerns, we recognized an opportunity for our library to provide community support. We developed responsible access decision-making workflows, which we've publicly released with Creative Commons licensing to be adopted and customized by other institutions to suit local decision-making practices and policies. The workflows were a bit too much to include on this slide, but they are viewable at tiny.cc backslash 71 JZSZ. The workflows related to copyright, contracts, and privacy rely heavily on following state and federal laws. The final workflow that we developed is based on local practices around ethical considerations, which is what we will be discussing today. I'm turning it over to Stacy to discuss how we laid the groundwork for this portion of our workflows. While well, three of our workflows, copyright, licensing, and privacy, were more straightforward since they were informed by law, our workflow for ethics presented a challenge. We didn't have law to guide us, and there's no consensus or uniformity about how to approach ethics when conducting mass digitization projects. So our working group began by conducting an extensive review of relevant literature addressing topics such as ethical approaches to digitization, definitions of harm and exploitation, and indigenous knowledge and sovereignty. Based on all of this, we developed two draft templates for local practices, one for practices around ethics and one for practices around ethical guidelines for indigenous materials. These two documents are currently in draft form as we continue with our community outreach feedback process. We considered these ethical questions through the lenses of three ethical frameworks. As an example to understand these models, imagine you have the capacity to help someone in need. Should you provide this help? A deontologist would recognize an obligation to help in accordance with a moral rule, such as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A virtue ethicist would act based on the fact that helping the person would be charitable or benevolent. 
and a utilitarian will point to the fact that the consequences of doing so will maximize well-being for the greatest number of people. Each of these normative ethical frameworks places emphasis on moral responsibility and the agency of the individual. However, assuming that there was individual free will and consent in relation to digitizing collections presents some challenges. First, structural power imbalances complicate the idea of choice or free will. Sometimes unequal power structure shape the creation or collection of archival materials. Collectors and researchers may be in a greater position of power than content generators, that is, the people who actually create the content or from whom the content is collected. This is a problem for a consent-based ethics framework because underprivileged groups may lack either the knowledge of how information about them will be used or the power to intervene in that usage. Since some of the content in our collections came to us without the knowledge or permission of the creators, an individual consent-based framework is not enough in determining our ethical decision. Second, collections could be shared and used beyond scenarios creators and owners originally imagined. Did the people who created the content in our collections, who are depicted in them, or who donated them, imagine that one day that content would be posted online, indexed algorithmically through search engines, or possibly analyzed through text data mining research? Can we say content creators and donors consented to these evolving uses? Again, while such questions might not represent legal problems, we might decide that there are certain scenarios in which we want to take a more nuanced ethical position. Finally, obtaining individual consent for a mass digitization program of tens or perhaps hundreds of thousands of items may not be scalable or perhaps even possible. Instead, what we need is a general approach consistent with our role as responsible stewards that will take into account unequal power structures and provide mechanisms for conversation. An alternative ethics framework that goes beyond free choice and consent and that takes into account unequal power relations might help us here. Ethics of care, which is associated with feminist ethics, is premised on relationships and care as a virtue. An ethics of care would see content creators those represented in our collections, donors, archivists, researchers, and the public as part of a complex network of relationships connected through empathy and responsibility, but also as embedded in power structures. What we choose to do as information providers will affect other people, particularly when people have less structural power, and we should care about that. Through its focus on relationships, an ethics of care approach also enables a progression from accounting for the rights and obligations of individuals to the rights and obligations of groups, which means we can talk about not just an individual in a photograph, but about where and how, for example, Japanese American internment materials should be shared online. It was also important for us to probe what we actually mean by the concept of harm. After considering different theorizations, our working group settled on the following definitions in relation to cultural objects. When we talk about objects, materials, or resources, we intend harm or exploitation to encompass economic disadvantage to the interests of a cultural community, such as unfair competition or commercial appropriation. The violation of customary or national laws or the established practices of a cultural community or risk of looting or defiling of cultural sites or resources. And when we talk about people, we intend harm or exploitation to encompass a deprivation or violation of or credible threat to a person's liberty, body, or well being. So, what should we do about the potential for harm? We could take a do no harm approach for which any potential for harm would unilaterally stop us from posting digitized content online. However, ethical considerations are rarely so straightforward, and this approach doesn't factor in the benefits that making such material accessible to researchers and the public might bring. For these reasons, our working group decided to approach this issue as one of balance. We ask whether the value to cultural communities, researchers, or the public outweighs the potential for harm or exploitation of people, resources, or knowledge. 
we then developed a set of principles for how to assess both value and potential harm. Some of the principles include things like, we'll give added weight to potential value where there is a strong public interest in the material. Considering factors like the content is about public figures or information is about communities, society, or political issues, or the content is self-authored, or the content is made up of government or journalistic documents, and so on. And we'll give added weight to the potential for harm where content impacts cultural communities that are historically disadvantaged by power structures, or if the material is about a community or creator rather than by the community or creator, or when the community or creator had or has less ability to control the information. Note that these guidelines are not prescriptive, but rather a flexible but principled framework through which to have conversations and come to decisions. I'm going to turn things back over to Michael now to talk about how we separately needed to adapt this balancing principle for Indigenous materials. UC Berkeley's Native American Collections Report highlighted the need to separately and specifically develop practices for digitization of and digital access to Indigenous materials. That report also recognizes that the University of California as a public institution exists in a dual trust relationship with both the people of California and with the people of Indigenous nations and tribes within the state. We acknowledge that we have a particular obligation to enter into collaborative and mindful stewardship with Indigenous communities. In our efforts to develop practices that satisfy these aims and obligations, we have created draft Indigenous collections practices. We are working with stakeholders on vetting this approach, but wanted to highlight the general direction it's taking so far. For the reasons Stacy mentioned about ethics paradigms, we adopted a similar balancing model for decision making about Indigenous collections, but with reliance on the American Philosophical Societies or APS protocols we introduced rebuttal presumed outcomes based on how materials are categorized. Our local practices suggest that indigenous materials, regardless of genre, be categorized by the library as either not culturally sensitive, potentially culturally sensitive, or culturally sensitive. We have defined culturally sensitive materials to mean any indigenous material that depicts a tribal spiritual or religious place, object, belief, or activity, which is based on the definition provided in the APS protocols. For materials categorized as not culturally sensitive or potentially culturally sensitive, we will presume, in the absence of additional evidence, that the value of providing online access to cultural communities, researchers, and the public outweighs any potential for harm or exploitation. Materials that are not culturally sensitive may be digitized and made available online. Materials categorized as potentially culturally sensitive may be digitized and made available online, but this categorization requires outreach and proactive communication with relevant indigenous communities regarding the category, categorization of these materials. For materials categorized as culturally sensitive, we will presume that the potential for harm and exploitation outweighs any value that might exist in allowing online access to the materials. These materials will not be made available online. The guidelines also make room for the library to enter into agreements with particular tribes setting forth the terms and conditions of access, to ask researchers to accept certain conditions for ethical viewing and use of indigenous materials, and to utilize collection metadata to adequately contextualize indigenous materials in our collections and to acknowledge explicitly the role of indigenous communities in the creation and co-creation of collections materials. It is also important to understand that the workflows serve a second crucial purpose as a framework to use when engaging the community about our collections. Accompanying the workflows is our online community engagement policy. Our community engagement policy provides a transparent approach for us to address user requests to restrict, limit, or remove access to digital content or to reme remediate metadata, metadata made available online grounded in the four principles that make up our responsible access workflows. In developing the principles, we took direction from the handful of leading academic libraries that have adopted these kinds of principle statements, like the University of Illinois and the University of Michigan. In addition, our policy expressly incorporates ethical considerations. <laughs>
This was particularly critical on our campus and with our collections, giving the breadth and depth of materials we steward regarding cultural communities who historically have been disadvantaged by Western power structures. We know that this was a lot of information. Stacy and I are happy to answer any questions you might have in the Slack channel or by email. I can be reached at mlang at berkeley.edu, that's M-L-A-N-G-E, and Stacy can be reached at srearden at berkeley.edu, and that's S-R-E-A-R-D-O-N. Thank you.